Everybody, it's Tyler here at Chessy Champs, checking out team number 2168, the Aluminum Falcons coming out of Connecticut. And I'm here, by the way, with Caitlin Operating, Elliot and Brandon. And we're going to be talking about more on this uh, modified robot they have from 2020. They've done a lot of cool stuff with this. you got to check out how this uh, uh, hopper indexer works. I'm very excited to talk more about this. Of course, there's shooter, intake, climber, and more all here coming up on Behind the Bumpers. Giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We'd like to thank Stryker for their continued support of First Updates Now. Stryker's internship portal is now open and available. Discover internships and rotational programs located around the world, including their headquarters in Michigan, when you go to careers.stryker.com and click on students and graduates. We'd also like to thank Kettering University. Kettering University is where robotic students come for their education. Over 30% of those who attend Kettering University were in high school robotics, and you can keep going with their BattleBots, VexU, eSports, and FIRST mentorship programs. If you are a U.S. student grades 8 through 12, scan the QR code to stay up to date on info and events happening at Kettering and get a free Kettering t-shirt when you sign up by December 12, 2021. So starting on this robot, let's talk about your intake. Let's show it off, talk about some of the iterations and changes that you made as well. Okay, so we kind of mainly stuck to the same point and we uh, didn't really make too many different like iterations over from our previous bot. Sure. The main iterations were made in the shooter, but with our intake, we had kind of one premise. We needed it to be wide enough so we could like basically just catch a ball from anywhere. In the starting, we have, we have like a mechanism to start within the frame perimeter. So over on this side, we have little uh, gas shocks that can actually drop when the intake is um, is like shot out. So we're in frame perimeter, and now we are a little bit out. So we can start within the frame perimeter, and I don't, I know you didn't notice, but these flaps were actually tucked behind the belt, and that was not on purpose. However, that is very convenient. So, and we also have little bungee cables to pull them out and extend them when they need to be out of frame perimeter. So I do want to ask you from the uh, that design of starting within the frame perimeter, was that one of those, like, that was the initial concept from day one, or was that like, oh, something didn't work out right, we got to make modifications? Um, no, we, um, we actually did want to have that. We ended up realizing that this was like right outside the bumper. Uh, the design constraint that caused these was being able to intake directly from the human player station. Sure. So when it's inside the frame perimeter, obviously it's legal, but there's a gap between the player station and the robot where the balls jam. So now that it's out, it sits flush against the wall and the balls drop right in. Fair enough on that. Uh, anything from that you want to talk about, like maybe some of the uh, material used for your intake or anything like that, or kind of uh, what rollers are you using, that sort of thing? So biggest thing is um, we have these uh, 3D printed mechanisms on the sides that help draw balls in. So if we run into a ball straight on, great. If we don't, if we're like rotating into a ball, we can still draw it in because these mechanisms draw the ball through this cutout and right up and into the hopper. So as you can see, we coated it with little strips of yeah. PTFE tape, which is the only thing that we found that made these balls not stick to each other. Well, Elliot, that's a nice segue to go into your uh, hopper. It's almost like a, it's like a half spin dexter almost. I'm it, really excited to talk about this. Really deep as well too. So in regards to like, uh, I'm assuming power cells not popping out, that sort of thing. Tell me a bit more about some of this. So as you say, a bit of a half spin dexter. That's what you the, actually call it? Uh, we just call it our hopper. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, the, the spin dexter is really the name for the little uh, piece of surgical yeah. tubing, which is our anti-jam mechanism. So with this hopper, the balls just sort of pile in there. And then as, the, as we shoot, the hopper runs and agitates them enough that they all fall into the trench. That trench is also coated with that same PTFE material so that we have no issues with jamming and the balls slide right on through into our shooter. From a timing perspective, when you have like five power cells in here, obviously they're kind of piled up a little bit, right? Yep. So if you want to shoot like really quickly or something, is that agitator just able to get them right in, in position right Absolutely. away? Absolutely. Okay, very cool. Um, and talk to me a little about uh, from this agitator kind of being in the middle, the way this uh, structure is on here. Uh, when you're looking at creating something like this, some teams do the agitator more kind of on the bottom versus this uh, type. Uh, Why did you choose to go this way on your robot? Uh, we chose the Omni wheel as the best way to center uh, the balls. They could fall right into the trench. Sure. Um, and then once they were in there, they got thrown straight into the shooter. Uh, the tower is designed to basically just protect the motor and the electricals. Okay. Um, it also conveniently provides a nice circular center for the balls to rotate around. 
but that shield is so that our power mechanism from the motor to the wheel is as simple as possible. Um, and so that the electrical and motor controller is protected from a stray ball. Well, let's go to your shooter next. You got a pretty massive hood as well too with that. So uh, talking about us power cells getting in the shooter and lined up, uh, how everything's going on with that process. So for our shooter, it's a four, four position uh, single flywheel with um, a backspin roller and some inertial discs. We have the ability to shoot from up against the wall on the white line in, at the front of the trench zone and behind the uh, what was the color wheel. Yeah. Um, although that one isn't uh, used all that often. Um, with the pneumatic positions, uh, those four positions are accomplished with two pneumatics. We have a large system that has the hood either all the way down or all the way up and then a small pancake pneumatic that activates and then hits a hard stop in that shooter to achieve either the uh, front of the trench or the white line position. I want to talk to you about on uh, the uh, contact surfaces on this. Obviously, you have some 3D printed surface that's on here, but then when it raises up, it's contacting just raw, essentially powder coated metal, right? And then into that, how did when you're looking at it from like design wise, how did you figure out like, hey, this is the type of material we want the contact, this is how much compression we want, that sort of thing. So the 3D print extends all the way down to the metal tines, um, but this was the shooter is really first iteration. Sure. Um, especially with regards to those tines. We figured that a small contact area was better than a, um, like a full sheet of, I don't know, say polycarb. That yeah, yeah, bent. yeah. Um, and so they're spaced wide enough that the balls don't get stuck, but the uh, indexer roller and the shooter do just a good job of whipping them through before they jam. Um, so, I don't know, it was kind of a choice of, hey, let's see if this works, and then it worked. <laughs> and then it worked, and right, yeah. So we called it good. No, that's fair, so. Uh, um, the one thing, you mentioned it being a very large shooter, that's yeah. partially due to the backspin roller, that's also partially due to the massive reinforcement that we did. So you can see that there's a huge 3D print, um, and that sets the structure for our hood, but we also like gusseted the snot out of it. Um, and that was because we had an issue initially with the drivers and operator, like trying to put the hood up underneath the color wheel and it absolutely mangled our shooter twice. All right. Um, to the point where we had to replace the whole thing. Yeah. So now we can uh, run into that and make that mistake without any issues. Let's keep moving on to your climber here. You guys got a climber that's able to translate on the bar or the switch, which is awesome. Uh, and I love the packaging of this too, the way everything just kind of fits in nicely. Talk to me more about that. Yeah, so th the climber was sort of the last thing to get allocated space. So it really is um, a packaging uh, challenge, we'll say. Um, but it fits right in the center of our robot, right on the center of mass. And uh, it's a cascading I-beam climber sure. that can reach the upper extremes of a bar that is out of our favor. So if another team's already climbed, we can climb on the other end. And then, as you say, roll right along that bar using a um, turned piece of uh, round Delrin as the mechanism to do so. How many stages are actually in this uh, climber? Uh, it should be four. Looks like a four stage? Sure. Yeah. So when you're looking at from a, a packaging standpoint, I know you said it was kind of towards like your the end for that, but it actually seems like to me like it, it should be there, right? It seems to make a lot of sense on that. So when you're looking at from your whole design process on it, I mean, I'm sure your climber's still in mind for where it's going to go, right? Of course, yes. It just, we had like the, it was going to go in the center, yeah. but the shooter was a little bit wider than we thought because of pulley placement. Like, so we said, okay, the, the climbers like skinnier. the programming team, they get it last, they right? Get I get last. it. That, that well, makes sense. Uh, for us, that's the electrical team. All right, well, <laughs> fair enough on that. Uh, let's talk about, uh, you got some custom swerve uh, modules on here too, uh, Brandon. So tell us a little bit more about what these are and then we'll start to wrap up on your robot. So with this specific module, we actually flipped the actual like motors and the plate so that it, we can have a little bit tighter packaging underneath our intake. And this uh, base plate is actually the like normal plate that comes with it. But, so, yeah. but um, our top plate, we actually modified in-house and we create that. We... So when we made the transition from tank drive to swerve, 
we chose the SDS uh, Mark II Swerve modules as our module of choice. Sure. And they fit great at the front of our robot where there's tons of space, but underneath the intake and hopper, there was absolutely no room for them. So we had to modify where the motors were, and so we flipped them underneath the base plate and created our own uh, pulley system to power the turning system and the drive motors. Let's wrap up on your robot here. We have some uh, CAD uh, that's up here. Um, I, I know we want to cover just a little bit about that. I know you're having a little bit of issues loading it up before, so I'm not sure if we're at the point where we want to be, but talk to me a little bit about uh, what you're using. So this is SolidWorks. Um, this is what our design team uh, plays around with in order to figure out what our robot is. Uh, the main design process that we use is we break the robot down into a couple different subsystems and basically designate teams for that. So we had a team that designed the intake, a team that designed the lift, a team that designed the shooter and hopper, and a team that designed the chassis. Sure. And so the neat thing on our robot is that all of those subsystems can be serviced independently. So this intake, while interfaces beautifully with the rest of the robot, can be taken apart and serviced, uh, something that we unfortunately had to do in, before last match, <laughs> um, in a matter of minutes. And the same is true for the shooter. It comes straight off the uh, belly pan, and we can drop in a replacement or change a bearing, whatever we need to. Perfect. Well, 2168 Aluminum Falcons, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about your robot here. Uh, of course, competing here at Chessie Champs, so we'll see how those results are after, of course, when this yeah. interview comes out. But can't wait to see what your team comes up with in future seasons as well. Thanks a lot for taking the time. Thanks for Ryan, interviewing. Thanks to Kettering University for their support of this video. Don't just sit in class. Kettering University is the only school in the U.S. that allows you to work as an engineer your first year with their three-month-on, three-month-off co-op programs. If you are a U.S. student grades 8 through 12, scan the QR code to stay up-to-date on info and events happening at Kettering and get a free Kettering t-shirt when you sign up by December 12, 2021. We'd like to thank Stryker for their continued support of First Updates Now. Stryker's internship portal is now open and available. Discover internships and rotational programs located around the world, including their headquarters in Michigan, when you go to careers.stryker.com and click on Students and Graduates. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.